so is sound is the sound meter thing up there working right now? Okay. I mean, I heard the it was picking up words or sounds earlier, so I assumed it was going pretty well. <coughs> All right, <clears throat> it's a few minutes past seven, so we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter three, and uh, we're going to continue on the series that we started three weeks ago. This is the third part, so it was three weeks ago tonight we started it. Um, the evangelism training or the ambassadorship. Um, I think on YouTube I've called it ambassadorship. I think that's what it is. Uh, so we'll go with that one. Ambassadorship. Uh, Romans chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 25. And uh, then we'll get started. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word. May we keep in mind the, the purpose that we're here, that we are actually meeting to come better equipped to be able to present your gospel in a clear and concise way so that we can make sure that we lead people to the proper gospel, that we can lead people to a saving knowledge of the truth of your word. We're thankful for this day. We're thankful for your word, and we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So the last time we left off, last, last Wednesday night, we dealt with the three critical issues. First, we talked about the four cornerstones, about preparation and and passion, and prayer, and persistence. Then we started talking about the three critical issues. And Romans chapter 3, verse 23, 24, and 25 covers those three critical issues. The first is that all have sinned. So that's what verse 23 says. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24 tells us being justified by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The only way that you can have redemption, God's only the only thing that God's going to accept for your redemption is Jesus Christ, the cross work of Jesus Christ, what took place at Calvary. And then the third thing is, it's not just faith that Jesus Christ was Jesus Christ but or that he died, but it's actually the faith in his blood, and that's what verse 25 says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So we, we started going through those the last time, and then we started talking about the fact that, you know, there's certain icebreaker questions that you probably want to think about using. Um, also getting into identifying where they are spiritually. You know, being able to have a conversation with somebody and, and when, I hate saying win their confidence, but that's kind of what it is. Just getting to know a person. And then through that, you can find out where, they're, where they are spiritually. And then finally, you know, one of the last things we talked about the last time was asking their permission to present them the gospel. Okay. So we start off, you know, just basically having basic conversation with somebody, finding out who they are. Um, we'll talk about some of that stuff a little bit later on. Uh, getting to a point where we find out where they stand spiritually. Um, and then then going a little bit farther and, and asking them if they would mind if we presented the gospel to them. And what we want to do tonight is take those three critical issues and look at them a little bit more in depth. Okay, So the first one in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. One of the questions that that we see, or one of the issues that we see on the the handouts that we have, um, and 
again, uh, as I've said before, if you want these handouts, just let us know. Email me at gregreeser, that's G-R-E-G-R-E-S-O-R, at crossworkministries.org, and uh, I'll get these sent out to you. Um, or I know, we've, I know I posted them up on our Facebook page, Crosswork Ministries. I don't think I made it available on the website, but um, you can get them through, the, through that. Um, but the first thing, first thing we're dealing with here, all of sin, what is sin? And then secondly, what does sin earn? And that's one of those things that we, we have to be able to know and be able to present to other people. Well, this is what sin is. Because a lot of times people, people don't think of something as being a sin. Sin is just missing the mark. And, and that's really what it comes down to. And there's, there's three things <clears throat> that, that I want to look at uh, as we go through here to see, see what's going on. So the question is, what is sin? Well, sin is every action, every attitude, and every thought, and every word that violates God's holy standard. Uh, run over with me real quick to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to go through a whole lot of whole lot of verses tonight, but it's going to be a critical issue that that you'd be able to not memorize all these, but be able to take people to verses and show them. And that's, that's one thing I said last time is if you get a little new, a pocket New Testament, could you grab mine real quick? It's on the bookshelf there. Um, get a pocket New Testament at least. If you, if you can, if you can't, uh, if you can't, if you get a whole Bible, that's fine. That's what I've got. <clears throat> and this will magically appear like so. <clears throat> um, so this is, this, is, this is the one that I have. It's a large print compact Bible. And <clears throat> I, love, I love this because it's, it's actually the entire. It's the entire Bible itself. Um, I can't remember where we got these from. I'm thinking it was Walmart years ago, um, but I'm going to put some information on, on I'll see what I, if I can find some place that you might be able to order them. It's a large print, uh, compact Bible, and when I say large print, it's, it's, <laughs> it's larger than some smaller, smaller Bibles print. Um, The words, the words, even in in my Bible, my actual big Bible is bigger than, than the large print here. But so it's relatively speaking, based on small. But this is the this is an entire Bible. It's the King James Version, um, and I would even go so far to say it's it's, it's the right King James Version. Um, it's a it's it's Holman Bible Publishers is where is where that came from. But I mean, just something like this to be able to open up to a passage, and and let the people actually touch it, and let the people actually read the verses themselves. There was a kid that I was talking to uh, for years at school, and I have my old study Bible uh, before I got the Schofield one. My old study Bible, I've got that at school, and so we're talking about all these things, and I give him the my Bible, and I say. Read Romans chapter 3, verses 23, 24, and 25. And he read them. And so, and he was kind of flipping about it. He was, okay, and so, what What am I supposed to do with this? So, you know, we have that conversation. I knew where he was spiritually because we've had conversations. And, and again, I hate to say when they're confidence, but I have. I've, I've created a relationship with this person. Now, one of the things that, you're, that we're going to have to deal with is how do you make those quick relationships with people that you don't know and you may never ever see again and that's where you know being a person that either waters or a person that plants though that's where we're supposed to be one of those two things okay <clears throat> but back to what we're dealing with here what is sin uh, notice in, in Romans chapter 1 <clears throat> I'm going to start off in verse 29. This is, this is what it means if you have an action, an attitude, a thought, or a word that violates God's holy standard of righteousness. We've got this right here. Romans chapter 1, verse 29 through 32, through the end of the, end of the chapter. 
He says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, <clears throat> without, uh, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So there's a list right there that Paul, or God through Paul, gives us. This is what it means to be filled with all, unri with all unrighteousness. And if you go through there, you can see that there are either actions or attitudes or thoughts or even words that violate God's holy standard. You know, we could, uh, we could also include lying and, and stealing, swearing, taking God's name in vain. <clears throat> if, you're, if you're taking notes at home, uh, put these verses down, write these verses down. For time's sake, we won't go over them, but uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 17, Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, Romans 3, 14, and Exodus 20, verse 7. I'm going to say those again just to make sure that, that, that you have a chance to write them down. Proverbs 6, 17, Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, Romans 3, 14, and Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. You know, when you, when you, when you watch something like this, especially if it's live, it's hard to, to get all the verses written down if somebody mentions them, uh, especially if you're trying to follow along and, and get the verses as well. But being able to see what, it's, what it means to violate God's standard, that's, that's what sin is. Sin is also every action, attitude, thought, or word that fails to achieve God's holy standards. So there's certain things that just flat out violate it. And then other ones that just fails to achieve. It's the idea of missing the mark. Right? You got a big bullseye. Um, archery is big here in, in Frankfurt. Uh, in fact, there's teams at schools, archery teams, they compete on state and national levels, which I didn't know that it was that big of a deal, but apparently it is. <clears throat> if you've got a bullseye in front of you and you've got a bow and arrow. If you miss the mark, you don't get to move forward. Well, that's the same idea here. Is God's already declared you've missed the mark. Your shot is off. You've missed the bullseye, and the only person that could ever get that bullseye was Jesus Christ, which is why everything is based on Calvary. That's where that's where everything is with God. This this also includes things like unholy and unmerciful, unrighteous, unthankful, not seeking God, having no fear of God, not loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, not being perfect, not continuing in well-doing. And there's a bunch of verses that we could go to for that. The idea is God set a standard. And what he, here's the point. It doesn't matter what you think is sin. God's already said this is what sin is, and every one of you's missed it. And there's nothing you could do or say or think of to change that. God's already declared it. In fact, you know, based on Romans chapter 1 there, go over to Romans chapter 3 as well. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Notice he says, What then are we better than they, knowing no wise? For we have before both we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. There's none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. The issue comes down to, and this is this is the thing when we take people to the verses, it's up to them do they believe the verses on the page. The purpose of the law is that all men would know that they're guilty. That they would stop saying, yeah, but I've done this or I've done that. And it's just it's to tell us to shut up. You're guilty. You've already missed the mark. There's nothing you can do, say, think, whatever, to change that. God's already proved both Jews and Gentiles as guilty. 
Another thing that sin is, is sin in our character or our conduct. And that's what we see here in Romans chapter 10, or Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. What we just got through reading. Dealing with the fact that his, our character and our conduct is an issue. We can also see it in Romans chapter 13, verse 18. In fact, we'll go over there real quick. Romans chapter 13. Wrong. We're in Romans 3, verses 13 through 18. I was like, there's not even a 13, 18. <clears throat> I read my, verse, my, my notes wrong. Romans chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery or in their ways, in the way of peace, have they not known? There is no fear of God before their eyes. <clears throat> when we when we take a look and read through these verses, that's why I say, don't be surprised when an unsaved person acts like an unsaved person. And as I've said before, don't be surprised when a saved person acts like an unsaved person. That's one of those reasons why we have those conversations with people and find out where are they spiritually. Because they could both be acting the exact same way and one person saved and another person's not. But it comes down to our character and our conduct. The way we demand our own way. There's people that I deal with on a daily basis. And it's not just kids in high school that are all about themselves. If they're all about themselves, Isaiah 53 deals with the fact that it's not about you. We're not, we're, not the, we're not the center of the universe. And that's one of those things that's hard for a person to accept. Is the fact that it, <clears throat> there was a kid, there's a guy that I played disc golf with. Um, we were talking the other day and he said, uh, he made mention about how he throws farther than I do and all this other stuff. And I said, you realize you're better than I am. But the fact that you keep bringing stuff up saying that you're better than me kind of makes you come off as a jerk. But that's what people do. It's all about them. It's the me first type of attitude. Not only that, but defying the will of God. The rebellion. <clears throat> when, you, when you go back over to Cain, when Cain slew Abel, what did God tell him? He said, you're going to be a vagabond. Which means you're not going to have a dwelling place. You're going to have to go from one place to another to another. You're going to have to walk around and not have a dwelling place your entire life. And what does Cain do? Cain goes and builds a city in complete rebellion against God. He says, I know that that's what you said, but I'm going to build a city and I'm going to have my own habitation. And I'm going to name it after my son. And that, from that point on, the heart of a city has been rebellion against God. When you look at the inner cities of our of the five biggest um, cities in the United States, I mean, you look at any big city. Look at the look at what's going on in those cities. It's rebellion. It's sin, murder, all the, I mean, anything and everything you can think of. That stuff's taking place at a higher rate than it is in most other places. Now, does that mean that if you go live in a small town that you won't have those things? Absolutely not. You know, that's one of those things. We like to watch 48 Hours and, and Dateline and, and 2020 and all these other shows where they talk about, well, I wouldn't expect it in a small town like this. Why wouldn't you? Do, I mean, do you not know and understand Romans chapter 3, verse 9 that says God's declared both Jews and Gentiles all under sin. Everybody's a sinner. You know, people people have a mass murderer in their neighborhood. And they say, well, they were just this quiet person. I, I would have never suspected them. Well, why wouldn't you? I mean, it's because, it's because people don't understand 
the rebellion that lies within us. You know, and I guess that's one of those, There's you always want to look for the good in other people. When we're, when we're looking at this, Romans chapter 1, that list that we're going through, really all that stuff has to do with is selfishness. Is it's all about me. It's all about it's all about I. It's what I want. It's what I want to do. It's what I want to have. It's get out of my way. I'm going to do this on my own. You can't stop me type of thing. Okay? That's what sin is. And I want to point out real quick, <clears throat> it's not just the actions. It's the thoughts as well. You know, <clears throat> if you think Of, of some sort of sin and you try to figure out some way in your mind could this take place the moment that you think about that it's become a sin you know when Christ when Christ comes along he says you've heard in, in, in the old time that <clears throat> dealing with fornication he says but I say if you look upon a woman with lust You've, you've, oh, you, you've committed sin already in your heart. You've committed adultery in your heart. And you think about that. He's saying just the thought of it is a sin. It's not actions. And that's one of those things that people think, well, me actually doing something or following through with it, that's when sin occurs. The moment that you think about it in your mind and think of a way to get it done, even if you don't complete the action, that's a sin. The thoughts, that's why when Paul says... Bringing, in, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Even our thinking has to be changed. And that's one of those things. When when we start dealing with, you know, we go to Romans chapter 6. We, we went through Romans chapter 6. We know that we're free from sin. That doesn't mean that we can't sin or that we won't sin. It's the fact that we're not going to be judged by sin because that's already been taken care of. But what he's talking about there is understand that you don't have to do it and change your thinking, which is what Romans chapter 12 is all about. Renewing your mind. Change the way that you think about stuff so you don't have those thoughts. And that's one of those things. People think that the actual actions of doing things is the issue. And it's, that's, that's never been the case. Go over to Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> okay. Now that we know a little bit about what sin is, and there's a bunch of verses in there just for time's sake that I'm not going to go over, um, but again, it's in the packet. Study those things out for yourselves. <clears throat> now that we know what sin is, what does sin earn? And you think about that for a second. <clears throat> How can sin earn something? Well, when you earn something, what do you think of? You're owed something, right? So if I work and I've earned money, what do they do? They pay me wages. Well, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is it that sin earns? Death. The wages of sin is death. The thing that you get because you're a sinner is death. Automatically. I mean, that's a pretty bleak out, out, outcome. Right off the bat. And a lot of people know that. that that's, the, that's why it's hard for them to accept that they're a sinner because they know that if I'm a sinner, then I deserve death. That's what my sin earns. But praise God, that's not where the verse ends. He, he goes on and says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is it that... What is it that can overcome that death is the free gift of eternal life. That's what, that's what God offers. That's what, sin, that's, what, that's what sin does. It earns a 
physical death. Go back to chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Sin earns a physical death. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that or for that all have sinned. It's a bad place to be. But that's what sin does, is it earns a physical death. Go over to Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9. Not only do we have that physical death, but based on Romans chapter 9, we also have a separation of the soul and the spirit. Hebrews chapter 9, we'll start looking at verse 27. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was, a, was offered to bear, was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. When we take a look at this, it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That separation between your, between your body and your soul for eternity. You know, I was listening to, I forget what it was I was listening to from Brother Jordan recently. But he was talking about that. <clears throat> when, when you die, when we die, a saved person, when a saved person dies, they ascend to where Christ is, which is heaven, paradise. When an, unserved, when an unsaved person dies, they fall down. And it's this feeling of falling all the time, trying to stop yourself from falling. You know, you know when you have those dreams at night <laughs> that you feel like you're falling? and you're trying to grab at something to stop yourself from falling, and fortunately, you always wake up right before you hit the bottom, if there is a bottom. There, there is no bottom there. And they're, they're going to have this feeling of, of, of a free fall for eternity with no way of figuring out, where am I? They're disoriented. I mean, you think about that state. Their soul no longer has this vehicle to carry them around, and it's just a free fall. That's what sin earns. Sin earns a spiritual death. Go over to second, or Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, start off in verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we, had all, we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, full, <clears throat> excuse me, Fulfilling, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That spiritual death. There's the rain. <clears throat> the spiritual death that, that everybody goes through. Here's the thing. Paul's talking to people who are saved, and he says, And you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Sin earns a spiritual death or separation of my spirit from God's spirit for eternity. <clears throat> Lastly, sin earns a second death. Go over to Revelation chapter 20. Get Revelation chapter 20 in one hand and, and Romans chapter 2 in the other. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 
Revelation chapter 20. Start in verse 11. <clears throat> All unsaved people will go through what we're about to read here in verse 11. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose faith face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and the death and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's that second death. There's there's a thing that's kind of, I think it's it's not really as much, as big as it used to be. A couple years ago, kids would always go around saying YOLO, Y-O-L-O. You only live once. And the idea is you're going to die. <laughs> Delilah says she still says that. But I mean, you think what, they, what they're saying is you only live once. Well, would it be better to die once or die twice? And that's the issue. There, there's a lot of people who are saying you only live once that are going to end up dying twice. They're going to experience this second death because they choose not to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is what their sin earns. Their sin earns a second death. Not just the physical death, the spiritual death, the second death. Chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21. Verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, notice, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You think about that. It's not a good place to be. Go over to Re go over to Romans chapter two. The separation that we could have, that unsaved people will have, from God in an eternal torment. Notice Romans chapter eight verse two. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Notice, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. That's the, that's the future for a lot of people. That's what that's what sin is. And that's what sin earns. And that and as I said before, that's a bleak picture. That's not where anybody wants to be. But thank God for Romans chapter 3 verse 24. Romans chapter 3 verse 24. Let's read it again. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Thank God that Jesus Christ came to do what he did on the cross. So that you and I don't have to stop at verse 23 for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. Because if that was if that's all the story was and we had to do things to be able to get that, we're not going to do it. And that's the whole point of the law is you can't do it. But thank God that Christ died for the sins. So what is it that we get from him? Well, we get eternal life through the cross. We get eternal life as a free gift. 
Notice. Chapter 5. Go over to chapter 5 real quick. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5. Start off in verse 6. God said, here's your problem. You're a sinner. You've missed my mark. You don't want to do the things that I've asked you to do. In fact, you can't do the things that it takes to get saved. Every action that you have, every thought that you have, every word you speak, all it's doing is showing you that you can't do it. And I've declared everybody a sinner. You've all missed my mark and you can't get it. But that same God that says that's the same God that provides a solution for the problem. And that's where a lot of people mess up. Is and, and this is one of those times when people are when you know when you're going through the what is sin and what is sin earn, though that's the time when people are going to start saying, Well, if God is such a loving God, why would he allow the natural consequence of sin is what we see around us. The reason that hurricanes happen, the reason that earthquakes happen, the reason that lava flows happen, the reason that sin, the reason that we have cancer in this world, the reason that we have AIDS, the reason that we have any sort of disease is because of sin. It's a result of that sin. It's a natural consequence to, to the sin-cursed world in which we live. But as I said, the same God that declared us sinners is the same God that provides the solution for us. Notice Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died died for us. Now when you think about that, this past week there was a guy in, in uh, France sees this baby dangling on a building. He scales up the side of the building, gets the baby, saves, saves the baby's life. Everybody calls him a hero. They give him French citizenship, all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> Because he's, when Paul says, when Paul says here in verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. This idea that you see a situation like, I would, I would, uh, I would allow my life to be taken if I could save that person. It's not a, it doesn't happen a lot. Then he says, Per adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But I want you to think, and I, you know, <clears throat> I don't know of too many people that have enemies in their lives. I know people say that they might have an enemy or somebody that they claim to be an, to be an enemy. But I want you to think of this. Look down in verse ten of Romans chapter five. It says. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled. The idea that God says, you're my enemy, and I'm going to send my son to die for you. You're ungodly, and I'm going to show you what my love does. It would be, yeah, it'd be like if, if Lex Luthor was in a situation where he was about to die, and Superman came in and got him out of the way and died for him. That's that's the idea. You know, all, all the craze today is the, the Marvel movies and all that stuff. You look you look in those. <clears throat> that's like Spider Man saying, Green Goblin, I'm gonna save you. I'm gonna give up my life. To save you. The real, the real enemy that we see is you and I. We're, we're completely against God. And God says, 
in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You were an enemy, and I'm changing your status from enemy to a son. I'm changing your status from an enemy to a saint. <laughs> That's some pretty good news. It changes the way you act. The key there is, notice, <clears throat> notice what he says. Verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Love is the issue. That, that is the key. Go over to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. You know, people, people say things all the time. Um, Delilah and I will, will say that, you know, I love you and, and all that. That's different than what, what God's talking about here. You know, there's there's brother there's brotherly love where you love somebody, but this agape love, an an unconditional type of love, that no matter what you do, no matter what you say, you can't stop God from loving you. Even if even if you're an enemy, and people throw those words around all the time, I love you. And I know people that feel sincere when they say that. But a lot of times people just say it out of habit. I love you. Just out of habit. God showed you how much he loved you. Notice 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth, know, he who loveth not, knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. God is, God is love. Getting to a point that you can say to an enemy, I'm going to die for you. That's love. I will. I would rather, you know. It's easy to say for me. It would be easy for me to say if if somebody breaks into our house in the middle of the night and they're coming in and they're going to kill Delilah and I say no, take me instead. That's one type of thing. But, for instance, our old neighbors. <laughs> it would be different if I ran over and said I'm going to give my life for them. Or think of the person who's treated you the worst in life. If you were ever given the opportunity to say, take my life rather than theirs. That's what God did. Why? Out of love. And there's a bunch of verses. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'm just going to just post up all the verses that I'm skipping tonight just because of time. Go over real quick. First uh, Timothy. First Timothy, chapter two. You know, you know how you you know how you answer the well if. if going on why doesn't he just save everybody well one is he's not going to overpower your will you have free will you get to choose which path you take if you want to know what God's will is first Timothy chapter 2 notice in verse 3 he says for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior notice verse 4 who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. God's will is that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. His choice. If he had his choice, he would make sure that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, this is where those things where people say, where it says, who will have all men saved, they say, well, God's going to just save everybody in the end. 
well, then why in the world are we going through the life that we're going through? If it's God's will that he's going to save everybody, why would he have us going through this stuff? Just get it over with. Because we have a choice in the matter. It's God's will that he, he wants everybody to be saved and to know about it. But some people choose not to. Because it's a choice. God will never overpower your will in your own life and choices. In fact, <clears throat> go over, go to Second, Second Thessalonians real quick. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians, <clears throat> chapter two. Second Thessalonians, chapter two. Um, Start off in verse, we'll start off in verse 8. Now this is, this is Paul talking about the tribulation period. Notice, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, here's the issue. People were taught the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, that he was buried, and then he rose again three days later, and they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They chose not to believe it. And these are people during the tribulation period through, this is right around where he says, and then that, and then shall that wicked be revealed. He says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They chose not to. And here's what God's going to do. Notice in verse 11. And for this cause, why is it that God's about to do what he's going to do? Because they chose not to receive the love of the truth. They chose not to be saved. Notice, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What he's saying is, because you didn't believe the truth, I'm going to allow you to want to see and believe because I am not going to overpower your will. Now there's a whole thought process out there in theology that says God's going to choose everything for you. The fact that I've got a big scratch on my leg from a log and I'm taking antibiotics and I'm having to deal with all that stuff and the fact that I've got poison ivy on me is it not covered, but pretty much one leg, the other legs, it's getting better. God preordained before the foundation of the world that that was going to take place. And there was nothing in my life that I could have done, chosen to not go where I've been, anything like that. There's nothing in the world that I could have done differently to have prevented this from happening. That's the thought process in that theology. What God says, however, is I'm not going to overpower your will. The reason you got the clothes on that you have is because you looked in your closet this morning or this afternoon when you got home from work. You looked in there and said, this is what I want to wear. I want to wear this so I can look good at work. And I want to wear this because I want to feel comfortable at home for the rest of the night. You chose that. It's the same thing with salvation. You choose to or not. The issue comes down to God has given us a possibility of having eternal life through the cross work of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for man's sins. We've looked at, we've looked at some of the verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 is the greatest... In fact, it's the gospel that saves. Christ is our substitute. He made a full payment, a fully satisfying sacrifice, what Paul says in Romans chapter 3. 
Eternal life is a free gift. Go over real quick. Go back over to Romans chapter 3. And get Romans chapter 6 as well. I'm just about to run out of time for the night. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word freely. There's a time in Scripture when someone quotes a verse and they leave out the word freely. If you go back to Genesis, <clears throat> when Satan comes up <clears throat> and starts talking to Eve, one of the things she says is, of all, the, of all the trees out here, we can eat. But she left out the word freely. Freely is, a, is an important word because that means that it's a choice. You're free to do it. Here it's being justified freely. There's nothing you can do to get the justification, but it's only by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, it's a free thing, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us what? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. No, you're fine. You're good. That's what happens when you try to quote stuff. It's the gift of God. Salvation is a gift. It's the gift. You know, you go over to Romans chapter 5. Not only do you have that as a free gift, but you have righteousness as a free gift. And you think about where we were just a few minutes ago when we talked about what sin is and what sin earns. And then we come over here and we find out that we have eternal life through the cross work of Christ. Not only that, but we have eternal life as a free gift. Now the last part. I might go a little over eight tonight. Not much though. The last part. Romans chapter 3 verse 25. Let's go back to Romans chapter 3 verse 25. If there's nothing else that you get, Romans 3, 23, 24, and 25 will get you. That right there is enough. Present that to a person. Verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. The issue here that God's looking for is... A one-time faith, exercise of faith. Notice, Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. The only response that God will accept ever is going to be faith. Faith in what? Faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's a choice. It's a personal choice that you and I have to make in order for us to receive that salvation. Now, we could believe that we're sinners. We could believe that Christ died. But it's only when we exercise that faith by free will, making a choice in our own mind that we accept every bit of that and we say the only thing that I'm going to rely on exclusively is the cross work of Jesus Christ you know it's easy to say hard to do because what's going to happen is somebody's going to say yeah but when were you baptized yeah but have you gotten the second 
Holy Ghost? Have you been? Have you received the Holy Ghost yet? Well, how do you know you're saved if you've not received the Holy Ghost? Well, what about the second receiving of the Holy Ghost? There's this whole thing that, that religion has to put you in the idea that maybe you've not been saved. But I'm telling you, Romans 3, 23, 24, and 25 is enough for you to be able to present to somebody and get them saved. It's a personal choice that they trust exclusively on the cross work of Christ. Getting the person to actually understand that that's all it takes is the issue. And that's where you're going to, that's, that's one of the things that you're going to get, that's going to be one of the toughest things to deal with, is, yeah, what do I need to do? Do I need to pray? You can pray. Don't think that the prayer saved you, though. Just realize that the cross is what saved you. And that's the issue. That's what it comes down to. Um, we've covered that, so I want to go ahead and finish up tonight. Memorize the crunch questions. Practice reciting them. We've got the three critical issues, and make sure you get <clears throat> at least a pocket New Testament. If not, if you can pick up one of these, it's a King James Version, large print, compact Bible from Holman uh, Bible Publishers. I'll see if I can find a website, maybe. Um, but I'm thinking we got ours at Walmart years ago. It's been quite some time. Um, but it, it, it comes in handy because that's something you can carry with you and then people can actually can actually read it um, on their own. <clears throat> Next time we're going to learn how to actually present the gospel and uh, three phrases, um, three, fra three, th three phases of the gospel presentation. So make sure you're with us next time. That's the first two lessons um, in three videos. And one of them went a little over an hour, maybe. Um, we do have the conference coming up in June, which basically June's two days away. Oh, man. No, it, like I said, the way I look at it right now is um, we're going to find out what we do wrong and fix it for the next time. Yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting some people. Yeah. Yeah, looking forward to, to meeting new people, seeing some old friends, and um, just just fellowshipping around around God's Word with believers of, of like precious faith. Uh, we're looking forward to that June 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Uh, if you've not, if you want to come and you've not registered, please do so on the website. And if you haven't yet, please make your reservations uh, with the hotel. All that information is on the website as well. So um, We'll pick up next time with the three phases of the gospel presentation, and we'll get at it. Well, thank you all for joining us. I'll look at a little bit later to see if you all joined us. But thank you for joining us, and we're going to go ahead and finish off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word. May we take the things that we've studied ourselves and that we're going to make available to study out for ourselves, that we actually have some to in your son's death, burial, and resurrection, that we life now and be able to present a gospel that is clear and concise that they're going to be saved is because they've relied exclusively There's nothing else. We don't want to muddy the water. We want to make sure that it's clear and concise. And that's why we're glad that you've written out in your word that we might be able to know how we're saved and that we might be able to come to the knowledge of the truth to bring others 
to that exact same saving knowledge. To the praise and glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, it's in his name we pray.